other areas. So uh, I think we have two very good speakers today who's going to walk us through the entire perspective about postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, may I have the introductory slide of Dr. Antonio so that I can introduce him and hand over the session to him. Can you please display this? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Cerulio has published over 500 original papers. His current uh, index uh, is 88. And he has chaired a number of uh, the International Diabetes Federation Committee for Development in 2008 and in 2011 for the update of <laughs> guideline for management of post meal glucose. He is currently the president of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. And uh, he's also the chairman of the Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease Study Group of the EASD. He's also served as reviewer for the two, uh, of the 2012 European Guidelines on Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Clinical Practice and for the 2013 European Society of Cardiology Guidelines on Diabetes, Pre-Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease developed in collaboration with the EASD. He's also served as associate editor of Diabetes Care from 2003 to 2011 and associate editor of Diabetes Medicine from 2005 to 2016. From July to, uh, 2016, he has been appointed as the editor in chief of the Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice, the official ID of Chernan. And he's also the, uh, on the editorial board of cardiovascular diabetology. He's going to talk to us about redefining postprandial hyperglycemia from the global perspective. I'll also take this opportunity to introduce Dr. V. Mohan. He needs very little introduction, such a famous personality that he is. He is the chairman of Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Speciality Center and president of the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation at Chennai. His main research interests are in epidemiology of diabetes and its complications, the genomics of diabetes and fibrocalculus and creatic diabetes. He's been conferred fellowships from all four Royal College of Physicians and all three science academies, academies of India, including fellowship of the Indian National Science Academy. He's received over 180 awards, including the BC, Dr. B.C. Roy National Award by the Medical Council of India and the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Centenary Award for Excellence in Biomedical Research from the ICMR, the highest award for biomedical research in India. In 2018, he received Dr. Harold Rifkin Award from the American Diabetes Association, and he's the first Indian to receive this award. Recently, he, was, he has been conferred the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's published over 1,320 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including 860 original articles, 300 review articles, and invited editorials, and 160 chapters to textbooks on diabetes and internal medicine. His work has received over 1,31,000 citations and has an index of 132. In 2012, Dr. Mohan was awarded the Padma Shri from the Government of India. And he's going to talk to us about redefining postprandial hyperglycemia from the Indian perspective. So I think I'm not going to waste any more time. We'd love to see both of these speakers. And over to you, Dr. Antonio. You see my screen? No, we don't, as it. You see now? No. Yeah, I think it's loading on. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, so, okay, why? Fine. Uh, thank you very much for very opportunity to underline again, uh, as uh, I, I already uh, underlined, how it's very important to redefine the postprandial glucose management in terms of uh, how important is uh, this point in the global management of diabetes even today. These are my conflict of interest. At the agenda, I will touch uh, the meaning of postprandial hyperglycemia, how we can assess postprandial hyperglycemia, and then what to do, how to address postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, 
Let's go to the definition of postprandial hyperglycemia. You know, there, there is a, a general um, meaning in terms of defining the levels of a plasma glucose. Of course, A1C is very well established, the mean value over the last few months. Uh, fasting glucose by itself does not need more definition. But about postprandial hyperglycemia, uh, the, the, there is no consistency between different, for example, uh, society or association. You see here that uh, even in terms of a normal value or the timing of postprandial hyperglycemia, the most important guidelines, <laughs> meaning ADASD, AACE, and IDF, are somehow different. Not only defining the timing on when to check postprandial hyperglycemia, but also what could be considered the normal value. It's well known that in normal people you have, of course, basal hyperglycemia, and after uh, heating, there is a, a slow increase of postprandial glycemia. And this is very well controlled the phenomenon. In normal people, glycemia is uh, always in a very strict, narrow range, even after the meal. The situation is completely different in diabetes. You know that according to the food, according to the therapy, <coughs> you can have a dramatic increase of post-meal glycemia, and uh, also the, you can define this as a postprandial post increment meaning the postprandial glucose peak uh, compared to the, the incre absolute increase uh, of, uh, over the preprandial glycemia. And this value seems to be particularly relevant, not only for the overall glycemic control, but also for the impact that could, can have on the complications. What is, what is contributing to the level of a postprandial hyperglycemia? Honestly, is a, a quite complex network because first of all, you have the preprandial glycemic level. Of course, higher is the preprandial level, higher could be postprandial hyperglycemia, vice versa. Lower is preprandial glycemic level, higher could be postprandial hyperglycemia. Of course, a key determinant is the amount of insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. The glucagon role, glucagon, as we see soon, plays a key role in uh, contributing to the absolute level of postprandial hyperglycemia. Meal size, meal content, more carbohydrate, more carbohydrate with low glycemic index, higher the risk of postprandial hyperglycemia. And finally, the gastric acting and as a relatively recent to show the role of incretin hormones. So you see it's a very complex network which contributes to determine the level of postprandial hyperglycemia. In preprandial state the, there are the, the two key hormones uh, uh, playing the, a key role are the glucagon and the insulin. Usually you know, uh, insulin in the preprandial, meaning fasting situation, is, is not very relevant. What is really relevant is glucagon because it's continuously stimulating uh, uh, neoglucogenesis, meaning that the glycemia we have in fasting condition is mainly related to the level of uh, the reaction of a glucagon. In postprandial state, the situation is uh, completely different. You have it because it's a, the meal is the glucose through the uh, contain the meal is coming in the bloodstream. Also, we know that today there is an increase in action. Insulin is increasing, and glucagon in normal people is decreased, meaning that there is a, a suppression of the neoglucogenesis. This is very important because if you suppress neoglucogenesis, the only level of, a, of a blood glucose is related to the action of insulin. 
what happens in diabetes? That because there is a, a partial insulin deficiency, this process is not going so well. There is also a relatively increase of glucagon and the liver can continue to produce glucose. Meaning that post in postprandial state, not only the glucose coming from the, the meal, but also the glucose still coming from the liver, which is not suppressed by, uh, by insulin, is contributing to, to the absolute level of postprandial hyperglycemia. And you have an idea of what happens in the healthy individuals or in diabetes when you give a mixed meal, glucose alone, or protein or fat. Protein and fats, they have a very, not very a, a big effect on, in, uh, on the postprandial hyperglycemia. But you see, when you, have a, you give a mixed meal, that in normal people, or even glucose alone, in normal people, there is a very quick increase of glycemia after the, the, meal, the, the meal of the OGTT, for example, but quickly, very quickly, is this, um, this situation is under control. In diabetes, this does not happen. Because in diabetes, we will see you have a specific defect of in first phase insulin secretion. So particularly the first, the first phase after meal uh, uh, is accompanied by high risk to have hyperglycemia. This the deterioration of a glucose homeostasis is a constant and progressive uh, issue. This is a very pivotal study from Rimonier showing that when A1C is a uh, uh, relatively good uh, control, the only level of a glycemia which is high is the postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, as you see on the left side, of this uh, cartoon, this slide, you see that for different levels of A1C, uh, even uh, until 80%, what you see, what which really contributes to the level of A1C is not fasting, but essentially postprandial hyperglycemia. And this is what happens in uh, normal or in uh, people with diabetes. <clears throat> As anticipated, the key effect in type 2 diabetes is the loss of an early phase of insulin secretion, which of course strongly impacts in favoring the appearance of postprandial hyperglycemia. How can we assess postprandial hyperglycemia? <coughs> Sorry. Of course, self monitoring is uh, the key. Uh, if you want to know the level of PPG, you need to measure PPG. And uh, there are some IDF guidelines uh, uh, suggesting that the right timing, the frequency, and so on, in order to keep uh, um, the value, and particularly to act after having the, the value. There, for example, this is a scheme of five-point profile or seven-point profile, within, uh, which can help to better understand what is the defect, uh, which timing is uh, more prone uh, to, to expose people to osprandial hyperglycemia, and then which could be the right action. Of course, recently, we also have the CGM, which, of course, is really not it's an important step ahead and you think uh, the CJ now we have the evidence that really postprandial hyperglycemia is a, a key problem even in type 2 diabetes but what about addressing postprandial hyperglycemia <clears throat> Again, a story, historical data from Rimonier was the first showing that particularly for level of A1C less than uh, 7%, 7.3%, there is a huge contribution 
of postprandial hyperglycemia to the overall level of A1C, meaning that if you want really to reach the target at least of 7%, but you see here also what the contribution in the range of A1C 7.3, 8.4 is a, a contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia is a, a still 50%, it's clear that if you want to reach the target, you have to control postprandial hyperglycemia. And this is a meta-analysis confirming this uh, evidence, showing that overall PPG is more sensitive, more specific, has higher predictive value for the, le uh, the uh, level of A1C. So this is a meta-analysis confirming what Monnier was first describing. But what is really astonishing, and this is what, why we have, in my opinion, to pay so much, very much attention to postprandial mm -hmm. hyperglycemia, is that even when you have a people apparently in good control with an optimal A1C, here you see an A1C <coughs> less than 6.9%, more than 52p of uh, these uh, persons they have high level of postprandial hyperglycemia, meaning that only apparently they are in optimal glycemic control. But from patient side, what are the consequences, what is perceived as consequence of postprandial hyperglycemia? In this survey um, developed in the United States, UK, and Germany, with the, including almost uh, uh, 900 people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, what is coming up is that, uh, that uh, uh, they needed to do something, meaning they needed to have a more uh, check of blood glucose more to contact more the health care physicians to get advice, to have more visit, and not, not, not less important, this was also um, leading to uh, lose some working days. So meaning that from patient side, the story of postprandial hyperglycemia is perceived as a real problem. What about long-term complications? Because you know, until now we have discussed the, uh, the role of postprandial hyperglycemia in overall glycemic control. In my opinion, this is enough. If PPG is contributing uh, to A1C in a very important manner, and A1C is related to complication, so it's clear that PPG is related to complications. But there, are, there is evidence linking directly postprandial hyperglycemia to the increased risk of retinopathy, increased IMT thickness. Uh, it is an independent risk factor for microvascular disease. Is uh, producing a, uh, the, the, um, a, um, endothelial dysfunction and oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, postprandial hyperglycemia as hyperglycemia itself uh, is uh, related and causing complications because <coughs> produce oxidative stress. There is uh, plenty of evidence that postprandial hyperglycemia is uh, really related to, to a huge increase of free radical overgeneration. And this is a, a historical picture. Of course, I am. Uh, I love this picture because it was my first uh, picture trying to show in a different way the concept of postprandial hyperglycemia because the idea was that like a wave after the meal, glycemia goes up and this uh, strong wave impacts on endothelium leading to endothelial dysfunction and osteoporosis. In the, this uh, picture, I suggest the key player was uh, the <coughs> oxidative stress produ production related to postprandial hyperglycemia, because oxidative stress induces endothelial dysfunction, which is the initial stage in the development of atherosclerosis, 
and also we had preliminary evidence to suggest that controlling postprandial hyperglycemia reduces the incidence of myocardial infarction in people with IgT. So, uh, meaning that uh, the hypothesis that postprandial hyperglycemia through oxidative stress generation leading to endothelial dysfunction can be involved in the pathogenesis, particularly of cardiovascular complications in diabetes, but not only by diabetes, but uh, probably also in pre-diabetes. And uh, this has been confirmed by a huge number of epidemiological studies. You have a, here a list. This is the, <laughs> the rest of the list. So all showing that postprandial hyperglycemia is, from an epidemiological point of view, strictly linked to the high risk of cardiovascular disease. But I think that there is uh, something very intriguing at Horizon. And probably uh, it's time for a paradigm switch in diabetes management. Oh, Why should we target one hour post meal glucose? Because, you know, usually in clinical practice, we check postprandial hyperglycemia after two hours. This is a worldwide uh, approach, I have to say. Uh, I, and, uh, I have the opportunity to underline this new concept in this paper published uh, a few years ago. And uh, it is based on the evidence coming from several studies, which I will uh, just summarize a few. In this study, Honolulu had program, one hour glyce hyperglycemia was linked to, to coronary heart disease. In this uh, very long uh, prospective study, 44 year follow up, diabetes and mortality risk was associated with elevated one hour glucose, while uh, fasting and two hour post load glucose, uh, as well as LLC, were less uh, strong in determining the, the outcome. There is another study, the Chicago Heart, Stars, Heart Association Detection Project in Industry, that again provides evidence that one hour post load glucose is an independent risk factor for fatal coronary heart disease and stroke. Why one hour post meal hyperglycemia is, should be more dangerous than two hours? One hour glucose might be more dangerous just than that of a two hour, simply because glycemia is higher, usually is higher at an hour, during an OGTT or post meal. It's a common sense. But there are data showing that the glycemia peak usually appears one hour after the start of the meal. So the story is very simple. If higher level of glycemia are dangerous, we have high, a very high level at one hour, more than at two hours after the meal, and then one hour pops prandial hyperglycemia. Can be more dangerous. But in this way, it's already, uh, we're already going the post prandial high glucose management guidelines from IDF. There were some recommendations, but particularly, <laughs> it was already suggested that PPG should be measured between an hour and two hours, not at two hours. As well, at least in my opinion, it's less uh, recognized, already we have also in the other guidelines that postprandial hyperglycemia should be targeted between one and two hours. So it's not only the position of IDF, also other well-established well Scientific society already suggests to measure the postprandial hyperglycemia earlier than two hours. Let's go to how to target postprandial hyperglycemia. Of course, I have to anticipate that uh, the diet is a key, a, a key factor. Diet with low glycemic index food is a, one important strategy. But we have uh, several tools, pharmacological tools, and particularly <coughs> in type 2 diabetes, we have a repaglinide 
and the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. It's well known how glucose, alpha glucose inhibitors uh, work. They delay the intestinal carbohydrate absorption and attenuate so possible glucose excursions. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, there are several side effects when you use these drugs. And one, um, the most one used uh, is acarbose, which is really sometimes not well tolerated. But the voglibose, which is uh, giving the advantage to have less uh, side effect than acarbose, so it could be preferred in order to favor the compliance of uh, people with diabetes. Clinites, they are uh, particularly in meglitin, uh, meglitinite, uh, they are taken at the meal times, and they particularly work in uh, in decreasing postprandial hyperglycemia. Why? Because there is a, a drug specificity for to increase insulin secretion, early insulin secretion, okay. and they have a very quick uh, onset of action. And because now we are speaking, how it could be important to control one hour, more than two hours, postprandial hyperglycemia, it's clearly, this could be really an advantage. We have a very quick increase of uh, insulin secretion to restore the first phase of insulin secretions. And also, um, the, as a side effect, there is a low risk of hypoglycemia, which usually um, is, of course, a very important uh, side effect of any drug. <coughs> so the the glyanats are rapid and short acting insulin secretacle that bind to the sulfonyl receptor on pancreatic beta cell to facilitate rapid insulin secretion, restore postprandial early insulin secretion, and reduce postprandial glucose spike. Moreover, alpha glucosidase reduce postprandial hyperglycemia and insulin secretion by delaying the digestion of carbohydrates and polysaccharides in a small intestine. It, it's clear that if you consider also the other good effect, but if you consider the, two me the mechanism of action of the two drugs, it's quite clear that the combination of these two drugs can really beneficially impact on postprandial hyperglycemia. The alpha glucosidase can slow the glucose absorption. The glenides can increase the first phase of insulin secretion. So the, is it the ideally uh, management of postprandial hyperglycemia. And particularly, um, the, there is a, uh, something very important because it can be used in people with uh, reduced kidney function, which is very often present in people with diabetes. But you know that particularly sulfanilures are not suitable to be used in these kind of patients. Uh, we have evidence uh, so, so me supporting what I'm, I just said. This study uh, consisted of four periods between, uh, between August and November 2011. In the first period, all patients received uh, a contrast control just water. In the next three periods, the patients received 10 milligrams of metaglinide or 0.2 milligram of oligos of a combination in random order. The main outcome was postprandial hyperglycemia and also the level of some hormones. Plasma glucose and serum insulin reached peak levels by 60 90 minutes. So between an hour and an hour and a half, effectively after the meal in the control group. The combination reduce postprandial glucose level compared with each drug alone, particularly at 30 90 minutes, which is significantly exceed the effect of methylenide alone. So clearly, 
combining these two drugs gave a better effect at using each drug alone. And let me underline in the timing, 3090, which as just recently underlined, probably is the key period of higher level of postprandial hyperglycemia. And you see here the details of this study. So this study revealed a marked different postprandial metabolic effect of methylenide, both glucose and its combination in patients with type 2 diabetes, and the combination therapy should be should enable tighter control of postprandial hyperglycemia compared with individual drugs. This is another study comparing citagliptin to methylenide, having and you see here also daily blood glucose fluctuation were significantly improved by adding citagliptin or methylenide to acarbose and improved after switching to the methylenide bone glucose combination. Why uh, I am just presenting this slide? Because one aspect of postprandial hyperglycemia is its contribution to overall glycemic variability, which you know today is a, a new frontier for diabetes management. So using the combination of uh, meglinides with, with the acarbose, also you can flat the glucose variability, which by, by definition is a very, very helpful in preventing diabetic complications. So in conclusion, Glycemic control is dependent on adequate regulation of fasting and postprandial glucose levels. Postprandial hyperglycemia is associated with oxidative stress, cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular mortality, reducing postprandial glucose levels in a lower which guidelines recognize the importance of of addressing postprandial hyperglycemia at every stage of diabetes treatment. Current ADA and IDF guidelines suggest targeting postprandial hyperglycemia at an hour and between an hour and hour and half after the start of the meals, respectively. Bogli both reduce PPG, reducing gut glucose absorption. Repaglinide reduce PPG increasing early insulin secretion. The combination of the agent is a rationally a good choice for a better control of postprandial hyperglycemia. Thank you very much. Dr. Antonio, and uh, I will request uh, Professor Mohan to give his talk on the Indian perspective of the same talk. Thank you, Sanjay. I'll just try to share my screen. Can you see the screen now? It's loading, sir. Yeah, we can see it. Good, good. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Sanjay, and uh, thank you, Dr. Serilio, for that wonderful uh, uh, update on postprandial hyperglycemia. For years, we have all admired your work uh, in this field, and I too, like you, have an interest in this one-hour uh, post uh, post glucose levels. We have done some follow-up studies which show that it's more predictive of uh, future diabetes in those with normal glucose tolerance. Uh, so we share. Uh, I think I agree with all that you have said. In fact, you made my job much easier uh, because I just have to speak a little bit about the Indian perspective because you have covered most of the points that we need to know about postprandial hyperglycemia, its importance and also the role of uh, both repaglinide and Wobiebo. So I will not spend too much time on the two molecules, I'll just be very brief in my presentation. I'd like to formally thank Dr. Sanjay Agarwal and the organizers of this meeting and also Medley Pharma, Mr. Power uh, and the rest of the organizers. I have no conflict of interest to declare. So this is a paper we published uh, many years ago, uh, looking at postprandial glucose levels in our population in, in relation to coronary artery disease, a population-based study. And you can see that not only is the two-hour uh, glucose, this is because we use two hours because for a technological study, not only is a two-hour value uh, correlated with the prevalence of the cross-section study with the uh, coronary artery disease, but also the, the two-hour values which uh, predicted in our population 
was much lower than even the impaired glucose tolerance. So it's above 140, which is impaired glucose tolerance. So even at the upper limit of normal, of the normal glucose tolerance, uh, the, this increase in coronary artery disease occurs. And I'm sure if you go back and went and check the one hour value in these patients, which we have done in some of our subsequent studies, you will find them to be very high. So the point that uh, Dr. Anthony Sirelli made about the one hour value being important is being increasingly recognized. In fact, there's a push now uh, to make the one hour value as the gold standard uh, for even for diagnosis of diabetes. And petitions have been made to the IDF and uh, to the ADA and uh, Dr. Sirelli is very much part of that. And we have also contributed uh, some data uh, to that. Now, when you talk about the Indian concept, this is also very important to know because uh, Asians in, in general and Indians in particular, South Asians in particular, eat a very high carbohydrate diet. And Dr. Sirelli showed you beautifully what happens when you take this high carbohydrate diet. In fact, across India, uh, whether it's north, south, east, west, central India or in the northeast, about 70% of the total calories <clears throat> comes from carbohydrate and in some cases even 80% of the total calories and therefore compared to what is recommended about 50%, 45-50%, it is much higher. We have recently shown uh, through a series of publications that white rice, polished white rice uh, is uh, especially in the south and in the east of India is an important cause of diabetogenesis itself of promoting diabetes because so much of carbohydrate is consumed that it uh, promotes the, the new onset diabetes and longitudinal studies the pure study which we just published in diabetes care about two months ago we showed that in a 15 year follow-up study the baseline carbohydrate uh, pre actually predisposes to the onset of type 2 diabetes in south asia uh, high consumption of starchy foods uh, include potatoes, sago, and of course also banana, chikku, mangoes, etc., which are very popular in India, as you know. This is a very interesting study in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Jaya Henry and colleagues, which we carried out uh, at the Oxford Brooks University. So what we did was we gave the same food uh, to white Caucasians living in the UK and the same meal, in this case, cereal biscuit, malted wheat cereal, malted whole cereal, sweet biscuit, sweet meal biscuit, and so on, and gave the same meal and followed the same testing patterns here in India and compared it with the white Caucasian population. And you can see the yellow is the, is the Asian Indian and the blue is the Caucasian, the white Caucasian living in the UK. You can see that the same biscuit, the same wheat cereal, and the same sweet biscuit and sweet meal biscuit all produced higher glycemic responses in Indians compared to the Caucasians. Think about it. The same food, but it's producing a greater response in Indians. This is partly because of what something which Dr. Sayeri also talked about, the lower insulin response, the, the lower insulin reserve that we have in India. We tend to lose beta cell function very rapidly in India. That's one of the reasons why we have one of the highest conversion rates from normal glucose tolerance to pre-diabetes to diabetes. It's much, much faster than it occurs in the white Caucasian population. Part of it is due to this. Now, when you talk about the management of postnatal hyperglycemia, and again, uh, the earlier speaker has already talked about uh, the drug treatment, but I would put it to you that uh, in our context, a lower carbohydrate meal with a lower glycemic index glycemic load is also equally important and just as important as giving specific drugs. The currently available drugs have already been alluded to by Dr. Cirillo, which includes repaglionide and the alpha glucose disinhibitors like Voglibose, which we use incidentally in our country quite a lot. These are not used at all in the United States and very little in Europe, I believe. But uh, in India, because of the, and in Asia, because of the, including Japan, because of the high carb uh, meals that we take, these drugs are actually quite popular. And of course, you have the faster acting insulin analogs, which work very fast. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, of course. Now, here is evidence uh, from uh, Jenny Miller, Jenny Brand Miller, showing uh, that if you use low GI foods, you can get an improvement in the glycemic control. There are many, many uh, studies which have been done which show that there is a considerable reduction in the postprandial hyperglycemia as well as in the A1C levels if you use the low GI foods. 
here is a study which we did. And uh, what we did was, because white rice is so commonly consumed, we looked at three things. One was we looked at the brown rice, and then we looked at the white rice, and then brown rice where we added legumes uh, to increase the fiber and the protein. And we looked at not only the glucose responses, but also the insulin responses. And we used continuous glucose monitoring in overweight, non-diabetic uh, Indians. And here are the results. What you see is that the, uh, the red uh, the lines represent uh, the white rice, and the blue represents the brown rice. And you can see that when you substitute white rice with brown rice, isocaloric, you can see that there's a considerable reduction in the peak of the postprandial glucose levels. And of course, now if you add legumes on top of that, you can see a further blunting of the glucose responses. We have, of course, done the uh, area under the curve and so on. And the, the white rice, it was uh, the uh, area under the curve was 81 compared to 65 for brown rice and 63 when you add legumes on top of that. And the fasting insulin also comes down uh, when if you substitute uh, brown rice with white rice or white rice with brown rice. So a conclusion was that consumption of brown rice in place of white rice can help reduce 24 hour glucose and fasting insulin responses among overweight uh, Indians. Now, coming to the drug treatment, already I think very nicely, Dr. Rilio has mentioned this. And uh, so we have drugs which augment the insulin secretion, and these are repaglionide, the glynides, and then you have, of course, the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Remember that the GLP1 receptor analogs also have uh, some effect, as do uh, the rapid acting insulin analogs. Now, Voglibos and uh, repaglionide, just a couple of uh, slides about them for completion's sake. Voglibos can be a candidate as an anti atherosclerotic drug. We talked about the reduction in postprandial hyperglycemia, but also remember that they increase the HDL, reduce uh, systematic uh, systemic inflammation and arterial stiffness, and they also reduce the uh, uh, carotid intimal thickness. And this is a study uh, which shows that uh, specifically to look at whether there is any reduction in the progression of uh, carotid intimal thickness is published in. DRCP, which of course uh, Dr. Cirilio is the editor in chief of this journal now, and where you can see that Voglibos could have, uh, reduce the intimal medial thickness progression uh, when followed up for a three year period. It's also been shown that Voglibos reduces the visceral adiposity, uh, it decreases the uh, visceral adipose tissue to the subcutaneous uh, adipose tissue ratio, the preferential loss of the visceral adipose tissue, which is exactly which what we want, because we know that the visceral adiposity contributes to insulin resistance, whereas the subcutaneous adipose tissue uh, is makes you more insulin sensitive. So, why is Voglibos preferred over other uh, alpha glucose inhibitors? I think this point has already been discussed uh, because of better compliance, less of the GI uh, side effects, and also it helps to reduce the lipid levels and so on. Now, turning to repaglionide, uh, already it's been beautifully described, so I'll just have a couple of slides on this. Uh, this is a, a belongs to the megalithide a group of drugs, and they act very uh, fast, and they uh, have a quick release of insulin. That's the reason why they're able to bring down the postprandial glucose levels. And I think you might have seen the slide earlier from Julio uh, Rosenstock's work uh, showing you that reduction in the postprandial glucose levels occurs very beautifully uh, with repaglionide, even much better uh, than with natriglyceride. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to conclude here so that we have more time for questions uh, by saying that postprandial hyperglycemia is harmful and must be corrected. Lower GI diet, 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 diets are very useful to decrease the postprandial glucose levels, especially in Indians and Asians who consume very high uh, GI and carbohydrate meals. And drugs like the alpha glucose inhibitors, particularly Voglibos and glynides, particularly repaglionide, and the fast tracking insulin analogs, when indicated, are also useful to control postprandial hyperglycemia. So I'll stop here and get rid of these slides. And am I there now? I can see myself, but I can't see the others. I don't know what yeah. happened. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a wonderful talk and. You really gave a very good Indian uh, perspective, and I'd like to thank both the speakers for the wonderful perspective that you've given. We have a number of questions, as expected, because it's such wonderful talk that you've given. But uh, what I would like to ask both of you is, 
why have the guidelines been so lethargic to change from two hour to one hour given the wealth of data that you've got saying that one hour is more representative you know of uh, the complications and everything so why are the guidelines still not incorporating it may i i'm yeah. so laughing i'm laughing because uh, you know my my first <laughs> uh, proposal to introduce the first time the hyperglycemia, the mountain is the strong hyperglycemia, was in 98. And we got to the first two guidelines in 2008. This is a, a huge, unfortunately, the usual process in medicine. Um, new concepts are very difficult to be accepted, even the evidence is there. And you know, Dr. Mohan, we are working on this story of an hour. Maybe it's very strong. I can anticipate that we are producing a huge meta analysis from filming. We already have IDF, the which is the one. We got only a good at the IDF. The last live IDF in Korea. It was discussed, and at the end, people vote. And people voted in favor of uh, using one hour. So, the reality always is going uh, faster than the scientific community in accepting the news. I'm sorry, this is the story. Do uh, <coughs> you think I? Uh, yeah, I think I agree with uh, Professor Antonio. Everything takes time because one of the reasons, perhaps, if I can say, is that most of the epidemiological studies have been based on two hours. And uh, when, uh, no, 1979 or so, when the NDDG first brought the IGT concept, it was based on the two hour value. And what happened was that the one hour value, people stopped doing it. See, my father was a uh, doctor. Antonio to know, uh, my father was the first diabetologist of India and so in 1948, uh, 50, he was already doing OGTTs and he set up the first diabetic <laughs> clinic uh, in Chennai, uh, in India in Chennai. And at that time, he used to do the five sample OGTT. It was 0, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120. Suddenly from five, they went to two. So only the fasting and the and the two hour. And I used to argue with my father this five times poking and all that, you know. When I was I joined him when I was 18 years old and I was working with him for almost 40, 50 years. Now I've been in the field. So the first 20 years of my work, I used to argue with him and say, let's drop some of these. There's too many times you're poking the patient. And he'll say, Oh my dead body, it'll never happen because everyone is important. And he was right, because the 30 minutes you need for the disposition index. The 60 minutes so beautifully predicts a future diabetes even better than the two hour value. And the 90 minutes still has some value. So he was right about all the five. But then later on, we started dropping the 30 and the 90. And we started taking, now we do three, zero, one, and two. We have always done. We have all, we have never left off the one hour ever. The 30 minutes we still use for research studies where we do this disposition index and so on. So yeah. it's very important to get those middle values also. Uh, I am not making a political comment. But the problem is that uh, uh, Americans are the leading science in the world and now and they are going for very prone to try to simplify. You know, they are proposing they want to simplify but they're not secure even for IGT. So they are not consistent at all. So uh, it's too complicated and not will go ahead. But if you recall, sometimes the evidence does not fit with the, the leadership <laughs> and this is all. No, so to go once further, they even left the two hours. So they said fasting alone is sufficient. And the rest of the world did not follow. They said IFG is equal to IGT, which we know is not true because a fasting defect is very different from a postprandial defect. A pathophysiology is different. One is hepatic glucose production and the other is glucose utilization. They're two completely different uh, pathophysiology. So WHO did not accept, Europe did not accept, IDF did not accept, EASD did not accept. But the ADA, you know, they just said, okay, let's get rid of GTT completely. Now, this one hour thing, just like you are moving, we are also, you know, working Ram Jagannath and Michael Bergman. We are working with uh, Vasudha, Huja, uh, you must be knowing all these people. So, we have uh, collected this big, huge meta analysis, including new data, and we are trying to look at it. And once all these get published, 
I think this one hour may come back, but we still don't have the long term, uh, you know, uh, the effects on the complications, all of which have been done with the two hour value. So that's another reason why they, they still hesitate to, to switch over. But to check postprandial control, that's a different, we are talking about epidemiological for predicting complications or cardiovascular disease, that's a different thing. But to see whether the meal is important, I think we should quickly change over to a one hour, uh, which makes sense. In fact, in our own center, because we did some early studies with Indian diets somewhere in 1980s, we took the 90 minutes. So in our clinics for the last 40 years, we've used only 90 minutes. We never used 120 minutes. Even for the postprandial C peptide, uh, to find the stimulated C peptide, we use 90 minutes because the peak kind of occurs at by 120, it's already coming down. So we feel that the peak comes at uh, 90. So, but anyway, it's a debate which will go on. But do you think it could be because the Western uh, diets are more protein based and are you know, carbohydrate based? And also, fat, like, uh, and protein, uh, they are fat yeah. also. Fat takes a longer time for the peak to occur. Whereas in yeah. carbohydrate, it peaks early. So that could be the reason why they're not really very adoptive of the one hour because the, you know, alpha glucoside is inhibitors are not very popular in those parts of the world. So they don't really emphasize too much on the post pandemic glucose. Uh, another quick question that I would like to ask you is the safety of using these drugs in uh, presence of renal failure. So there's been a lot of questions that have been asked that, you know, uh, safety in uh, use in renal failure in pregnancies. So, what is your take on use of these drugs in these situations, and what sort of you know uh, red flags would you have for this? I think that for voglibose or the alpha glucose days in general, uh, it depends on, for any drug on the level uh, over the level of damage of a kidney of course because do not forget the story of SGLT2 that we were thinking <laughs> never to use and then no, we are protect we are using even with a low level and also with forming you no know? with forming now the GFR le level has been decreased and so on <clears throat> I don't think that <laughs> there is a real contraindication in general I would not prefer with the very advanced kidney disease to honestly use uh, uh, probably any oral drug, uh, this is uh, in general. Particularly also phanidurias, okay, by definition, but for reputable I entirely agree, because I think once EGFR has gone below 30, insulin is always uh, best. But there's no real contraindication, the only for for voglibose or AGI, it will be the digestive problems because already they have GI disturbance and you have renal problem, you add to that nausea and loss of appetite due to that. So it may not be the ideal drug and by that time, the priorities are different. So if your EGFR is 30 or 40, your, your priority then is not postprandial hyperglycemia. You've got so many other priorities, you've got blood pressure control, you've got so many other things to do. We should do all this much earlier. As far as the as glenides are concerned, they are actually approved in renal inception, see, because they, they are short acting and they fit the bill very well. And therefore, I don't think there is any contraindication to using them in renal uh, problems. But again, it depends. If it's just a short acting drug that you need, then it's an ideal drug, no side effects, and you can use it. But if uh, you are going to switch over to insulin, then there is nothing like that. Uh, how effective would the glyanides be? Because by the time a renal failure develops, your pancreas are more or less fired and may not really get the optimum effect of glyanides either in those situations. It works both ways. Sometimes, you know, what happens due to the renal inception C, the diabetes severity starts coming down. Burnt out diabetes, we say, ultimately, they don't need any drugs. That's what in, in advanced yeah. renal failure, the, actually, the drugs come down. And also, the insulin excretion via the kidney gets reduced. And therefore, some of these drugs will actually work very well in, in renal. Uh, problems and you see, remember a renal problem the insulin also can produce hypoglycemia so using a gentle drug like this uh, where if it is needed if there's no contraindications uh, it's not a bad idea at all unlike the sulfonylureas which will get prolonged and they already have a longer action where they can get hypoglycemia these are very short acting drugs so they are actually supposed to be taken with every meal so instead of taking it every meal you take it with say once a day or twice a day you take it it will cover the major meal so it's not a bad idea uh, to take it. Some of these drugs have not, uh, the glinide group has, I don't know about uh, Italy, but 
in india and in many countries it really didn't take off because you take it three times a day yeah. the cost became a factor uh, whereas the agis are used quite a lot but the lineites are really not taken off but if the cost is brought down then they are nice gentle drugs to use when needed ஒரு <laughs> You know, up to the eight hours that you keep working in the final period. So, is there any importance to that? Uh, I am. Uh, I I published many years ago now. This is story of uh, uh, osa state because it, usually you do not eat only carbohydrates. You eat the proteins, particularly fat, and unfortunately. they combine in producing the damage because it's correct to speak about postprandial hyperglycemia we cannot forget that also postprandial hyperlipidemia is dangerous and when you combine uh, high postprandial hyperglycemia high postprandial hyperlipidemia you have a longer dangerous effect because glycemia at high post ppg appears first then later who have uh, hyper <laughs> postprandial hyperlipidemia <coughs> so this is very very dangerous and when they are together present the final effect is you uh, is amplified in terms of damage to the oxidative stress production and so on so as a corollary to this uh, book i mean we still conventionally keep checking fasting lipid profiles i think it makes sense that we look at you know either random lipid profiles or postprandial lipid profiles because postprandial lipidemia is actually a more important risk factor than the fasting lipidemia and yet you know labs after labs keep stressing that come fasting for uh, your lipid profiles so what's your take on this so i <laughs> very simple question <clears throat> you want to know what happens in your real life no if something is wrong for your patient so how, how many hours are we spending in fasting in real fasting only few so this is was a, a a mistake because try to standardize we are we were used to measure everything particularly in the uh, in terms of metabolism in long term fasting condition this was to try to standardize but this is not the real life you can have optimal fasting like lipidemia fasting glucose and then after meal for hours because we eat three times even more so on we have a very dangerous situation so you pick one point fasting and you are happy because the patient is has a good glycemia and good <laughs> lipidemia and then for the rest of 20 hours is a drama so this is to try i think the problem is how we introduce this in clinical practice uh, it's very slow process the more uh, cuz you need to measure this is the problem yeah so the problem uh, sanjay is the standardization see at least for, glu- for glucose carbohydrate you can say 1 hour 90 minutes to hour but with the mixed meal and this protein and fat it can be 3 hours can be 4 hours can be 5 hours we don't know when to pick it and it depends on the meal if you take a pizza it will be very different from if you take chapati and uh, some dal or, or some curry or, or something else so it's going to be very different and that's so it's a lack of standard there been a lot of studies trying to capture it the postprandial triglyceride particularly cholesterol doesn't change much but the triglycerides do change they very difficult to stand it in some meals will be 4 hours some meals will be 5 hours uh, so in practice how to measure and when to measure becomes a problem okay both of you were a little bit short in talking about use of wogley bars in pre diabetes so uh, what would your recommendation be you know we know that okay metformin is something that is standardized and it's accepted where do you put sort of wogley bars uh, when it comes to use in pre diabetes 
there have been a number of studies that have been looking at this entire thing. So, your take on this? Uh, okay, we have, uh, okay, I mean, if you uh, talk about specifically alpha glucose, it is we have so strong evidence about high carbose or even low glucose. Uh, maybe, I have to be honest, maybe the ideal approach could be metformin plus half a glucose days because it's, a, it, at least, it's a, for example, in Italy, it's very cheap, this combination. So why not do? The problem is the huge number of people to treat. And this always has been the real barrier for the pharmacological prevention of pre-diabetes because you know, for one people with diabetes, we have almost four with yeah, diabetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the level of healthcare systems, I don't think that is affordable. But honestly, at the level of individual person, if you believe that you're, a, let's say, patient or person with pre diabetes, can be usefully treated with, uh, I think, a combination. Why not? There are so full few side effects. And so much advantages, I think that could be very useful to prevent diabetes. Dr. Mohan, your comment? So, yeah, I mean, the active makes logical sense because we are in a pre diabetic stage, we also eat the high carbohydrate meals, and that's going to keep on increasing, pulling out all the insulin, and therefore keeping those values down, particularly uh, as uh, Dr. Antonio said, you showed uh, the uh, CGM graphs can clearly show whether the peaks. Are, are going up. Um, I have actually some case studies to show on Voglibos itself. There was a patient who came to me and he said, oh, this is not pre diabetes, because it's diabetes. And he said, you know what, my after breakfast, lunch, everything is fine, but post dinner is high. Uh, so we did the CGM on him and then said, you do the first day without Voglibos, next day after Voglibos. And you can see it completely flattened out. You know, what was going up like that after dinner completely flattened out with just one uh, tablet of Voglibos taken at that dinner alone. He had only problem with dinner. So you can actually make, bring in precision diabetes like this by, by adding that. Coming back to pre-diabetes, the problem is we don't have the trials. Uh, so off-label, we can always use it. I don't think there's anything wrong in it because I don't think you're going to get hypoglycemia with this and therefore your PP levels are going to go down and the patient has educated himself uh, and is using CGM or something and finds his sugars are high, we can definitely use it. But the stop NIDM trial and others were done in people with diabetes, not really. In, uh, so, and so to, to kind of extrapolate it uh, on to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to give everybody with pre diabetes uh, alpha glucose inhibitor, or for that matter, even repuglenide or something, if we have some trial evidence by using that. Uh, that you can actually prevent the actual onset of diabetes by many, many years, yeah, then it's worthwhile. But then people will argue and say you're, you're treating the condition even before you get the condition. So for what, what sense does it make? And uh, in the DPP and others trials, metformin didn't do as well as lifestyle. And the other danger is that people may give up on lifestyle and say I'm taking this medicine so I don't need lifestyle. So I think lifestyle is still key. So diet and exercise is still key. On top of that, for a motivated patient who is still worried about the glucose excursions, A1C is not coming down to the normal level. Giving these, I don't think there's anything wrong in giving. Okay. For the sake of primary care physicians, a uh, very basic question to really uh, what uh, you would like to know is that when you introduce, let's say, uh, alpha glucosides, boglibose, or for that matter, glyonides, do you introduce it only to the meal with the highest glycemic response or do you do it for all the meals you know that the patient consumes so which is the meal that you really target or you know do it for all the meals as such so how do you kind of introduce the combination or a single agent for these patients uh, I, I, in my opinion uh, nevertheless in this case could be very beneficial to have a glucose profile before deciding by definition, of course, with the main meal, you have a higher risk to have a post higher postprandial hyperglycemia, but you cannot exclude other conditions. So why to before starting, let's say, okay, let's say one week glucose profile, and then we decide uh, which is the best timing uh, to, be, to take. This is my opinion. What? Uh, it will be done either with the SMBG, where you get a seven-point profile, or you can do a CGM and then you see the 
uh, first one week with the CGM and then you see whether all the meals are high uh, or only two of the meals or one of the meals. If, if all the three meals are high, then you have to give it all the three times. Because both these drugs are meant to be taken with every meal, actually. But suppose you find that his uh, breakfast or lunch uh, is in such a way that it doesn't go high, but only dinner goes high. The other way around, the breakfast is the problem, but the other two are, are okay. Then for that particular meal, if you give it also, there's nothing wrong. Uh, unlike, uh, you know, the use of sulfonylurea or metformin, these are meal-specific uh, medicines. They are prandial regulators. And therefore, you can give it once a day, or you can give it twice a day, or you can give it thrice a day. Yeah, because uh, when I see these things, you need the individualized uh, therapy. Sorry to be, for example, you spoke about breakfast. Probably in India, it is one of the main meals. In Italy, many people are having breakfast with an espresso. I don't think that is a, <laughs> the right timing <laughs> to get that drug. So, this is really. But this shouldn't take away the fact that you should always look at the meal composition before you, you know, just think that, uh, you know, giving the alpha glucosidase inhibitors is, a, is mm -hmm. a logical solution because very often the composition of the meal may be a problem causing the postprandial hyperglycemia. And I think um, you need to have a good nutritionist who's looking into the meal pattern and, you know, seeing what the composition is. And maybe you could modulate that and then add an alpha glucosidase inhibitor. Uh, uh, one, uh, one other question that, you know, was uh, you know, kind of uh, being asked was how important is, you know, how often do you find that hypoglycemias occur, especially when you combine with insulin? And this is more relevant because if you find that the post-dinner values are high or post-prandial, you know, post-dinner uh, hypoglycemia and you have a basal insulin on board, how often do you see late, you know, hypoglycemias that may occur with the patient? Using what? The uh, Voglibose? With and Voglibose and or with the combination of Voglibose and Glanides. Especially Glanides because Glanides can, uh, you know, with the, when you combine it with I would not associate the Glanides with the insulin. That's not to make so much sense. <laughs> if you, what I mean, you are using insulin because you suppose that your patient does not have enough insulin. What you can get with the green eye is just quitting the <laughs> residual beta cell function. Makes sense to use, for example, Voglibos because it can help, particularly if you have only basal insulin, can delay the peak. So it's okay, meaning that meantime, maybe you can spare some prandial insulin because you can do this with the Voglibos more than with the fast acting insulin. But I would. Uh, <laughs> I could not use uh, glenides uh, with insulin. Uh, you often do find prescriptions where they use sulfonylurea as well as glenides together. Is there any rational to this? Dr. Mohan, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so because they're both secretagogues. Of course, you can argue that they work on the different receptor and you can make a case for it, but. I don't think it makes sense because first of all, you're over stimulating the pancreas. Second is that if a sulfonylurea doesn't work, then why would a, a glinide work? And combining the two really doesn't make sense because combining two different groups would make sense. Now we have six, seven groups. You have a sensitizer, you have a, you know, a AGI, you have a SGLT2 working on the kidney, you have a, either a sulfonylurea or a repaglinide working on the pancreas, beta, beta cells. So that makes sense, but combining these two doesn't make any sense. This combination uh, could work very well for insulin companies. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one. <laughs> I will ask one last question that uh, we didn't mention about pregnancy. Uh, can you use Voglibos in pregnancy? I mean, uh, that's one question that you know everybody has in the mind, top of the mind. Dr. Mohan, because me, I am a very conservative person, so I would mostly use insulin during pregnancy and at best if something uh, metformin. I don't use sulfonylureas, I definitely don't use glinides. And Voglibos, again, you know, when you have hyperemesis and so on, it may not be a good thing to do. But I know somebody who has done a small study on this. There's a Dr. Bhavadarini from 
hero i don't know that she is listening to this but uh, she did a study on some 50 patients with pregnancy and she found good effects and she said there were no side effects and i've used it i don't know is really approved for it i don't think there's any contraindication to using it but to me when the you know when you have hyperemesis and you have other problems to go and use a voglibos there uh, is not really uh, the ideal situation i would and see think about it the pregnancy if you're talking about gdm usually sets in in the second trimester okay you're talking about 24 to 28 weeks or 20 24 weeks you've got only 14 18 16 weeks to go you're talking about 3 months why not just use the insulin and be done with it the mothers are so motivated at that time that's the one time they will do whatever you tell them to do and insulin is the safest there is no doubt about it uh, so i would use that although i would say in a good 30 40% of the ogitions have now started using metformin and the mic trial showed that about 50% of the pregnancies they can get away with metformin and metformin is kind of approved now uh, so i still don't use too much of it but uh, unless they are already on it for some pcos or something and then i'll say continue that but add insulin so but i don't just start metformin alone that's my uh, view but a lot of people who like metformin and they use it but i don't think really any other tablet should be used during pregnancy it should be insulin i agree yeah. i think it's so stimulating talking to both of you the questions can just keep flowing and you know it's lovely to 